Uh, I'm Brad, and if you don't know me, I'm the Argyle campus pastor, and so I'm on the, the preaching team. There's a few of us that preach here, and we preach from God's Word. We preach Christ from the text because that's what the Bible's about, and so that's what we're going to do this morning. So to remind you, we're in 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to start in verse 18. All of Scripture is profitable. All of it is good. It's all tenderloin. It's all sweet. And in our culture, we're a scrolling culture. So if something is somewhat confusing or doesn't catch our interest or is a little bit hard, we tend to just scroll past it and move on. And we can do that with the Bible if we're not careful. But the reason that we preach sequentially through books of the Bible, verse by verse, is because all of the Bible is good. Now, our text this morning has some obscure parts, some hard parts. Martin Luther, the founder of the Protestant Reformation, legit Bible scholar, said that this text is one of the most obscure texts in all of the New Testament. So we've got some work to do, but the good news is we have context. So what you don't want to do when you read the Bible is just grab a verse and then ascribe your own meaning to it. But you let, you let the Bible interpret the Bible. So context matters. So for example, if, if I lean over to you and I say, this is really sad. And we're at a funeral. Well, you would, you would say, yeah, this is horrible. You know, we, we loved that person or whatever. But, but if we're at a wedding and I say the same thing to you, it's going to be out of place. You're going to be like, why does he not want them to get married? What's the problem here? Context matters. So the context of our text this, this morning is, is Peter is writing this letter to these exiles, these Christians who are living in these various regions and they are feeling like aliens, like exiles. They're not at home, even though they're physically at home. And so they're, they're beginning to face persecution and they're beginning to struggle and suffer. And Peter just keeps reminding them over and over, align your life on the cornerstone of Christ. There is an imperishable hope, an imperishable inheritance that you can cling to when life gets really, really hard. And so Peter is writing that to them. He's even explaining, you can be blessed through suffering. Do you know that? In verse 14 of chapter 3, it says that, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Peter is saying your suffering's not meaningless, but that Christ also suffered. Align your life with him. And so that is the context of what we're looking at. Let's start looking at verse 18, which is a, just a dense gospel in a verse. It says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. For Christ also suffered. I don't know what you're dealing with or have dealt with. I don't know what physical pain you've experienced. Maybe you've recently gotten a diagnosis, or maybe your body just hurts physically. Have you experienced that? Or, or maybe it's relationally. Maybe your marriage is totally messed up, or maybe your family situation is just all kinds of broken, and you've experienced betrayal or divorce. Maybe you've been through something really hard relationally. Maybe you've had a friend who has betrayed you. Or maybe your suffering is, is more spiritual. Maybe you just have this dark cloud of depression over you. Or maybe you're, you're really, really struggling against a besetting sin that just keeps coming back over and over and over again. You're being tempted. What, what this text says, Christ also suffered. What that means is we have a sympathetic Savior. He knows He's walked the human paths of suffering. He's been physically hurt. He's relationally been hurt. When he went and prayed, he, he told some of his buddies, hey, just would you stay up with me while I pray? Would you just, just stay there with me? He goes off and prays and he comes back and his boys are asleep. They've just bailed on him. Judas betrayed him. Peter denied him. He knows what it's like to have relational problems. And then spiritually, though Jesus was tempted, 
He felt the full brunt of the temptation of the evil one. He didn't flinch. But he knows what it's like to be tempted. He knows what it's like to suffer. And we need to know this. We need to know that he knows what we're going through. But, but there's something that Jesus also bore that's really, really important here. It says he suffered once for sins. What that means is that Jesus didn't just suffer physically and relationally and spiritually, but he bore the full wrath of God for sins. The full wrath of God, forsaken by God. He bore that on the cross for the sins of others. That is a pain and an anguish which we can barely even consider. But he bore that wrath, and that wrath is due for anyone who is sinful, which means all of us. It says that he suffered the righteous for the unrighteous, the innocent for the guilty. Jesus was without sin, without spot, without blemish. Though he was tempted, he never gave in. He was absolutely perfect in righteousness. And yet he was crucified on the cross between two criminals. The righteous, the innocent, suffered for the guilty. Now when we see someone falsely accused or wrongfully accused these days, we're, we're rightfully very angry about that, and we should be. That's injustice, it's wrong. Jesus was fully innocent, yet died for the guilty. We have the tendency to, to look at, at, at this idea that, that Jesus suffered for guilty people, and we think, yeah, for those guilty people. But we tend not to look at ourselves as that guilty party. So I want to, to go to 2 Samuel. You can turn there with me if you want to, but you don't have to. 2 Samuel 12. This is a story which illustrates our need for grasping our unrighteousness. David, King David, was a guy, and he had a gigantic failure. So King David made a huge mistake. There was a woman that was not his wife. He went and took her, and he had her husband killed. He made a huge mistake. And so he's dealing with this sin. God sends a prophet named Nathan to David. Nathan's going to tell him a story. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, there are two men in a certain city the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and his children, and it used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guests who had come to him, but he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing, because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, you are the man. You are the guilty one. David was looking at this story of this person who had victimized someone else, and he thought, that person deserves to die. Nathan turns the tables on him and says, you are the man. I don't know about you, but it's, it's easier for me to look at, at a depravity, at sinfulness through a telescope. It's easier for me to look at headlines and go, that person's messed up. It's easy for me to look at someone else's household and go, that's broken, that's sinful. But to look in the mirror is much more painful. And I'm telling you, it's very important. Until you grasp your unrighteousness, you will not understand the magnitude of God's grace. Until you understand you're the man, you're the woman, that Jesus needed to die for. You won't get the cross. You won't understand. So moving forward, why did, did Christ die? He suffered for sins bearing the wrath of God, the righteous for the unrighteous. Why? That he might bring us 
to God. That's why. Because sin separates. Sin creates a a chasm in our relationship with God. We can't stand before a holy and righteous God without a mediator. We can't show up with a ledger of our good and bad stuff and have it go well. It will never go well. And so we need a high priest. So Jesus goes before. He suffers for the guilty. And he bridges that chasm and he says, come meet my father. Come. I want you to know that that if you are in here and your faith is not in Christ, this invitation is for you. Jesus says, come meet my Father. I know you have sinned. I know you're not righteous. Put on my righteousness. Come meet my Father. Every one of us lives our life by a certain standard. We, we have a, a way of looking at the world to where basically if, if X, then I'm okay. We, we, we have a way of living. And so it might be if my kids are healthy and happy, I'm good. Or maybe if my work is going well, my portfolio is up, then I'm good. Maybe if, if, if my political party wins this election, then, then I'll be good. But we all have a standard that we try to live by, that we mark our lives by. And you'll lean in one of two camps. You you might be a legalist. What that means is, is you are a rule follower and you find your worth and value and you're following the rules really, really well. And this looks like the kind of person that's buttoned up, they're always on time, they get good grades, they're, they're squared away, and they're super proud of it. And a legalist is someone who, who is like a Pharisee in the Bible, and these were these super religious people who followed all the rules and thought that God should love them. Just so you know, that's not what Christianity is about. You cannot follow the rules well enough. You can't. That is not what Christianity is about. And if you are a legalist, that's what you you try to do. If you're a good legalist, if you're good at following the rules, you're good at keeping things kind of above board and you live a, a decent life where you're a relatively good person, if you succeed at that manner of, of living, you'll become snobby and haughty and you'll look down at other people. But if you're bad at it and you fail, which you will, you'll become completely despondent because your standard has failed you. Your armor has been shown as being paper thin. You've got nothing to stand before God and you can't even stand before other people. That's what legalists do. The rule followers. I'm a good person. Question for you. When's the last time you confessed sin to God? Or when is the last time you confessed your sin to someone else? If you cannot confess sin, if you have a hard time with that, you very well may struggle with being a legalist. But maybe that's not you, and you're like, oh, those rule followers, I'm into licentiousness. YOLO, you only live once. Licentiousness, it just means you have a a license to do whatever you want to do. And so you try to cram as much joy, as much pleasure, as much happiness as you possibly can into every day, into every year, and into your life, because in your mind you're thinking, this life is short, I better eat and drink and be merry, because it'll be over soon. So I better maximize my joy, because this is all that I have. I'm here to tell you, if you're a Christian, bucket lists are stupid, I don't know if you saw the movie, I didn't, but the idea is this. There's a guy who has a terminal illness, and he says, I want to do these things, this list of things before I kick the bucket. I want to do these activities that will make my life having been worth living. And so I don't know what he did, but the idea of a bucket list is I'm going to go fly a hot air balloon over the Grand Canyon and swim with the dolphins, and maybe I'll make a hole in one. Like there's just these, these things that we think will go give us life. There's no life there. You can do all of those things, the things that you've really wanted to do. They still won't satisfy, not in the end. 
Because licentiousness, a license to live however you want to, which is clearly spelled in in, in verse three of chapter four, those just living out those desires, it'll ruin you. I lived my life for many years this way. And it's empty. It's empty. If you're good at licentiousness, if you're good at YOLO, just living however you want to for the now, you'll destroy yourself. I've buried people who were good at licentiousness. It's a very dangerous path. And if you are bad at licentiousness, if you don't have enough money to sustain the lifestyle, or you get caught, or you get whatever, and your, your licentiousness, best life now, gets shattered, you will be completely hopeless. Because you'll think, I can't live a good life. And you'll become sad and depressed. And, and the problem with both of these standards is you cannot confess and repent by these standards. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 28, verse 13, this, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. We need to repent. We need to be able to confess, I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If you're a legalist, you cannot repent because to repent as a legalist is death. You've seen those people that have that tattoo, death before dishonor. That's this idea. I'd rather be dead than dishonorable. A legalist cannot confess because they've built their identity based on their performance. So to say, I'm not perfect, I'm a sinner, it's sacrilege to them. You can't do it if you're a legalist. And if you're into licentiousness, just living your best life now, repentance is a ridiculous idea. It's dumb. Even the word coming out of my mouth just sounds stupid. Because if you're trying to live your best life now, you have no need to look back and repent at what you've done because you're just looking forward to the next moment. These standards are, are harmful. They will destroy you. And the, the Christian standard, it's not good behavior. The Christian standard is Christ. So you don't find your identity in checking all the boxes or being the best person you can be, but you find your standard, your acceptance in Christ and in Christ alone. That's where you find your acceptance. And when you fail, you're not defined by that, but you're defined by the one who never fails and who will never fail you. And when you suffer, you have something to grab onto. Because the the standard that you live by, the way that you see the world and what you cling to, that is what you will suffer by. And you will suffer. So how does the gospel relate to suffering? The the title of, of the sermon this morning is The Glories of the Gospel Through Suffering. How does the gospel of Jesus Christ speak to our suffering? Well, first, let's look at some of the super confusing things in this text and clear it up because it'll tie in to this. So you've got people preaching to spirits in prison. You've got Noah in there somewhere. And then you've got the idea that baptism saves you. Well, okay, let's start with baptism. Baptism does not save you. Jesus saves you. But the act of baptism is the personification of you being dead to sin and alive to Christ. So let's, let's read verse 21. It says, baptism which corresponds to this, this being Noah being safely delivered through the floods. We'll get there in a minute. Baptism which corresponds to this now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body. You don't come out clean from sin when you get baptized just by virtue of the water. But as an appeal to God for a good conscience, through what? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the affirmation that we make when we're baptized, they say, do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? You say, yes. You go under the waters. I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That confession, that, that faith of yes, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, that is what saves you. 
Saves you from the judgment, the due wrath of God that Jesus took on your behalf. The flood waters of judgment. So, so that's where Noah comes in. Verse 20, because they did not formerly, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. So if you don't know the story of Noah and the ark, back in Genesis, shortly after God had created everything, the, the earth, after sin had come into the world through man's choice, was increasing in corruption. People were bad, and, and continually bad. And so God told Noah, he said, hey, build an ark, a big ship, in the middle of the desert. Build an ark, and I want you and some of your family members to, to get in that thing and, and bring certain types of animals because a flood is coming. A flood of judgment. I'm wiping out everyone, but you will be covered if you go in the ark. And so he was a shipbuilder. He's out there in the middle of the desert building a ship. But, but 2 Peter 2.5 tells us something else about Noah. It says, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, a herald of righteousness in the Bible, that word, it means he was a preacher. Noah was preaching righteousness. And with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, Noah was brought safely through the waters. That is what baptism is like. Because there is a flood of judgment coming for every one of us. We will give an account for our sins, for those dark thoughts, for the dark actions, all of those things that we have done. We will give an account. You can be brought safely through those waters as Noah was and as baptism represents. This is for you. This invitation is for you. And all it takes is faith in Christ, which even that is a gift from him, not about your performance. So th there's this, these, these waters of judgment that we need to be delivered from, but there's other waters that this text really refers to, and that is suffering. That is suffering, and some of that is, is brought on by our sin. And I don't know if, if you, you grasp this. I don't know if you read this text and you, you kind of feel separated from it, but, but let me help you. So if you've ever been angry in a, in a road rage situation, I'm not saying you did anything, I'm just saying someone cut you off and you were angry and that anger boiled inside of you. Or maybe you've been angry at a, a sibling, a brother or sister. Have you ever been angry at someone? The Bible says that's murder. Have you ever had lustful thoughts for anyone that is not your spouse? The Bible says that's adultery. I could go on and on and on, but there will be a reckoning and we need an advocate. Christ is that advocate. But, but also, okay, when we fail in life, when we strike out, when we flop, it could be at work and the project that you've worked so, so hard for, just a failure. Or it could be maybe you fail as a parent. I fail as a parent all the time, and I, instead of imaging God's kindness and patience, I image something much darker. Impatience, anger. Have you ever failed if you're a parent? The answer is yes. We fail, and, 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 and that, just, that just happens, and, and, and we, we have to figure out when we do, how do we live with ourselves when we fail? How do, you, how do you deal with yourself when something that comes out of you is inadequate or shameful? So in like the 17th, 18th century in Japan, there were the samurais, pretty cool dudes, there's a really dark element to samurai culture because what would happen is they're an honor culture. And so if a samurai did something to bring shame upon themselves or their family, they would commit suicide. They would bear that shame by killing themselves. And, and one guy even said this, he said, in doing so you become like a god because you can no longer be criticized by the world. 
How sad is that? How sad is that to have no mechanism for shame because all of us have done things that we should be ashamed of. All of us will be outed as imperfect people and we need to be defined not by us, but by the perfect one who does nothing shameful. We need to ride the coattails of Jesus Christ when we fail. And when you suffer, when your body fails, when you're sick, when you get that diagnosis, or when you're grieved and you have those dark nights of the soul, when your, your money starts to run out and you begin to just, just feel horrible about life, what are you going to do with that? You can numb it. You can numb it with, with alcohol or entertainment or travel, but at some point that runs out. You can try to ignore it, but that's not going to work either. You can give up, but does that sound like a good option? I mean, what, what are you going to do when you suffer? The truth of the matter is that, that in Christ, speaking to our sin, speaking to our failures, speaking to our sufferings, these floodwaters that come up against us, in Christ, if you find your, your hope in him, you can float like Noah did. You can rise above these waters, and you can know there are better days ahead for you. This is true. 2 Corinthians 4.17 illuminates this hope that we have for this light momentary affliction. I don't know what you're going through, and it's probably not feeling light and momentary. But if you're going through something, it is a light momentary affliction that is preparing for you an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. When life gets hard, and it does, and it will, when the waters of suffering and judgment and your own failures come up against you, if you find your hope in Christ, you can float. So the standard that you live by is the standard that you'll suffer by. And if you look at verse six of chapter four, this is really part of the promise. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead. The Bible says if, if you're not in Christ, you're dead in your trespasses. I hope that's not you. If it is, come to Christ. That though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. So in Christ, we can have life forever. We can have resurrection and we can have hope no matter what you're going through. John 16, 33 Jesus says this, I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world. If, if you want to be an overcomer, hide in the one who has overcome. Live hidden in the ark of Christ. Find your hope there when you're hopeless because the waters are going to rage in your life, but I would just plead with you as that happens, put your faith in the one who can calm the storm with just a word, it says be still. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this beautiful, and robust word from your scriptures. We thank you that we can be reminded of our hope in Christ no matter what we're going through. That when we fail, we're not defined by our failures. When we sin, we're not defined by our sins. But if we put our faith and our hope in Jesus, we can be brought safely through the waters no matter what this life throws at us, no matter what ruin we bring to our lives. Your hope is not contingent. It is not soft. It is imperishable. I pray that for those that are in this room that are suffering in some way, 
Or maybe they've made a mess of their lives. God, would you remind them that faith in Christ lifts no matter the waters that rage. So now as we sing and reflect upon these truths which you have prepared for us, may we just rejoice at our hearts at the good news of who you are for us, Jesus. We love you and we pray this in your name. Amen.